Hey everybody, uh, thank you for joining. Um, and thanks to Product School for hosting me. I'm really excited to share with you today about how to estimate product value. Um, before we get started, uh, I do uh, wanna share a little bit about myself. Um, I am currently a product manager at Nike um, and I work on omni-channel marketing, content and personalization. So a lot of really cool stuff. In the past, my career has spanned uh, video games, digital media, and streaming streaming video. Um, so uh, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and I currently live in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, I threw up this uh, favorite quote of mine uh, onto the screen uh, to sort of get into the right mindset. And also, I think it's important as a sort of a preamble to our talk today, uh, which is that uh, let me be smart enough to know how dumb I am and give me the courage to carry on anyway. Uh, that's a quote by Austin Kleon, a business author. And uh, I use that to say um, for today, uh, the frameworks and the models I'm going to share with you have worked in my career. Um, they work for uh, pitching product, for thinking about how to improve a product and uh, get alignment from stakeholders and all those things. Um, but I don't have an MBA and I'm not a finance major. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, what I share with you today is a good input into your growth as in your career. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, let's go from there. Uh, uh, next is um, I do need to disclaim that uh, this presentation is based on my personal experience only and doesn't represent the views of my company or any other company. Um, and all the data shown in this presentation is based on market research, uh, assumptions, and publicly available information only. Cool. Let's go. In terms of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of an intro to business value, what it is, uh, why is it important, why is it important that we measure it. And then uh, we'll go into a, sort of a click down and talk about what is the mental framework that we should have when we think about business value in our companies or organizations? Uh, and then third, we'll really get into the meat of it. Uh, we'll talk about the, the actual model. Um, how do you estimate business value um, and sort of a step-by-step -step process and how to build that model uh, and what are some important things to consider? And then uh, just some concluding thoughts. So uh, hopefully this is gonna be really cool. Okay, intro. Uh, I love this quote. It's uh, by an author, Robert Thompson, Hooked on Customers. Uh, and he says, customer centricity should be about delivering value for customers that will eventually create value for the company. Um, and I think that, uh, that I love this quote because um, it sort of brings to mind two concepts. One is customer value, which is the value that is created for a customer. And then one is business value, which is the value created for a business. So today we're gonna to talk about the latter mainly, which is when we create value for a customer, what is the value that we get in return? And oftentimes um, those two things are intertwined, but when it comes to estimating the value and making decisions about what to do, uh, we'll focus on the, uh, the business value today. Now, why is estimating business value important? The reason why is because when we don't estimate business value, we end up building features based on vanity. Uh, we love them. We're copying other companies. Uh, we think we should build these things. Uh, we just want to build a cool product without really understanding what is the impact we're having. When you get into that state, uh, you end up wasting resources. Uh, we, we don't have infinite resources as uh, companies and uh, we need to try to make sure that we're investing our resources in the right things. And if you're not measuring um, or have a sense of uh, what is the impact of what you're building, then it's easy to sort of like um, kind of be wasteful with the engineering or other resources we might have. Also, um, when you're kind of like building things based on what you think is cool or um, copying other companies uh, uh, or other things like that, you kind of de deliver average value in the sense that some things you do will be really good. 
uh, and because they're obvious. Um, and then other things might not be so good because we thought that they would work really well, but they didn't. Uh, so you end up av- kind of delivering average value. Um, and then the, the last thing is that um, when you don't estimate business value as a process in your company, um, you end up uh, sort of making decisions that are very subjective. You say, hey, like maybe you, you might think um, or other leaders in your company may think like, hey, I, 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 I'm a good proxy for our customers. Uh, and so I have a good idea of what we need to build. Um, and I, we've all... Um, We've all dealt with that. We've all been um, uh, uh, sort of guilty of doing that. And our leaders are too. And when the leaders do it, uh, we call that HIPPO, which is highest paid person's opinion. So these are all sort of the impacts that we don't estimate business value. So um, we estimate business value so that we can work on high impact features. So when we know um, what is the impact of the work we're doing, we can index on the highest impact things. When you're working on high impact things, then you know that um, for the engineering resources or whatever resources you have, um, you know that you're gonna be spending them wisely on kind of the most important things. Estimating business value also helps us do the right thing. It allows us to do the right thing by our customers and for the business. It allows us to understand um, building the right stuff versus building not building the wrong stuff. And then lastly, it sort of allows the best ideas to win. So when you have a, a framework for quantifying the expected or estimated business value of a product and you apply that framework to everything, then it doesn't matter whose ideas inform the products you build. If everyone in your company follows the same process uh, and you're able to say like, hey, of these 10 features, um, this one's gonna de- deliver a million dollars, this is gonna deliver 500,000, then whoever comes up with that best idea, that idea wins uh, and that's really important. So the goal of estimating business value is to go from what, what, I, what I sort of think about as low maturity or lower maturity um, product organization to a, a much higher maturity one. So we wanna go from vanity features to high impact features. We wanna go from wasting resources uh, to spending those resources really wisely. We wanna go from delivering average value to delivering industry leading value for our customers and for the company. And we wanna go from subjective hippo uh, decision-making to uh, having the best ideas win no matter where they come from, whether it's you as a product manager, an engineer, a QA analyst or a leader. So that's the goal. Um, Now, before we get into the next section, I thought a good exercise uh, to just to level set is to, um, uh, in your own time, uh, reflect on a big feature that you're currently building or recently shipped. Set a five to 10 minute timer and answer some or all of the below questions. What was the feature or product? Why did you build it? What was your team's decision-making process? How did, how did it perform compared to your expectations initially? And based on that, how would you rate your company's maturity when it comes to estimating business value? So just a good thing, uh, food for thought. Cool. Okay, uh, now let's go into our framework and business case. So we're gonna start to uh, go a click down and talk about um, the framework for estimating business value and, and then the model. and. Uh, it's hard to talk about these things abstractly. Um, so I tried to pick a, um, a company and product that I like that I have no association to uh, uh, to sort of give us something to sink our teeth into. And uh, so the one I picked is Spotify. So this will be really fun. Okay, let's go into the framework. Now, uh, the framework here is sort of the mental model you should think about when you think about 
business value as it, as it applies to your company. Um, a couple of definitions first. Um, the first one is this idea of leverage point. So leverage point is an organizational area where a change can affect business value. In Spotify's case, a couple examples might be their content strategy or their publisher tools. Uh, so these are any areas where if you, if you do an activity, they contribute to business value. Um, and a key thing here is that products love leverage points. So products act on leverage points to deliver business value. Within the content strategy at Spotify, those products would be those carousels you see in the app that say, hey, like, good evening, here are some recommendations, or um, you, here are your top shows, or here are some laid back beats. Uh, those are examples of uh, personalized music recommend recommendations that are part of Spotify's content strategy uh, and that sort of act on that strategy as a, as a leverage point to deliver value for, for the customer and for the, the company. So the way that the estimated business value model works in this context is that it's a method for estimating the business value that a product will generate when it acts on its leverage point. So this is a little bit abstract. So a uh, really good way to think about this is uh, SpongeBob and his buddy, uh, I forget his buddy's name. So apologies for any SpongeBob fans. Um, but the way to think about these concepts all together is basically like, uh, imagine you have a seesaw. In the center, you use your leverage point. On the right-hand side is your business value. It's the thing you're trying to deliver. And on the left-hand side is your product, uh, the product you want to build or the feature. Now, um, let's take that concept and apply it to uh, some uh, potential ideas for Spotify. Um, one is this thing that doesn't exist, thankfully. It's a, a Spotify newsreader. Imagine if, if uh, someone pitched this idea like, hey, Spotify should have a news app that you can read. We would look at that and we would say, hey, um, using our mental framework for business value, um, we, we don't think this is a good idea. And the reason why is because users don't want to read Spotify. We assume that. Um, we also assume that news is kind of, um, uh, uh, news reading is kind of costly to produce. It's low margin. It relies on subscription revenue or viewable ad revenue. Um, so in that case, uh, the product is expensive. Uh, your leverage point is high since you're focusing on your content strategy, but your success uh, is probably gonna be low uh, just because customers don't want it. So we're not gonna do it. Low negative value. Um, now, uh, alternatively, uh, there's this idea of Spotify podcasts, uh, which is a product that Spotify has today. Oops, uh oh. Um, so in this context, um, for Spotify podcasts, we think uh, this is a high value proposition. And the reason why is that listeners are adopting podcasts and migrating to platforms that offer great podcast experiences like Apple, Stitcher, and Radio Republic. Uh, people's behaviors around audio listening are shifting. So uh, they're sort of adopting podcasts uh, more uh, broadly. Um, so it's an important space to play in. And for Spotify, this is a really good area because um, they have industry leading personalization, uh, publishing analytics, uh, advertising capabilities and brand recognition. So uh, we think that yes, like if they develop this product uh, and, and uh, sort of grow it, um, they're going to be able to lift uh, their monthly active users and other key metrics in their business. So uh, this seems like a good area to focus on. Now, um, I got the slide switched around there. Sorry about that. Uh, so um, before we go on, uh, so we talked about the sort of mental framework for business value um, and how to think about it uh, in, in the company like Spotify. 
but it's good to think about in your own company uh, or your product or uh, whatever context is important to you. Um, so what I would do is uh, reflect on your product or company, set a timer and answer a couple of these questions. Try to think about what are your company leverage points and how will your upcoming product or feature affect those leverage points? And are those leverage points high or low? Meaning the things you're gonna work on, uh, are they gonna actually deliver the business value that will justify, justify them? Cool. Okay, let's go into the uh, nitty gritty in the model itself. So what I'm gonna share with you is the model that I built for Spotify. And I'll break down how I went about building it. Um, the first thing I wanna do is I'll show you the summary page. So I'll, I'll give you the uh, sort of completed model. And then I'm gonna work backward from there and show you how I, how I built it and how you can apply this to your own company. Okay. So this is the completed estimate for the Spotify podcast business. It is the estimate for their incremental revenue from today going forward. So it doesn't uh, estimate the total um, value of the podcast business, but more like the podcast business and its growth and its contribution to the uh, baseline uh, for, for Spotify going forward. Um, so my range here is 330 to 830 uh, million dollars worldwide annually. Um, it's a wide range, and we'll talk about why. And I also listed my assumptions here, which we'll talk about. So when you're building a model like this, where do you start? Like, what? How do you even get to this place uh, for your product? Step one. Uh, open Google Docs or an Excel spreadsheet um, for your product and list your top line product metrics. So uh, these are your known product metrics. Um, they can be broad. If you're thinking about standing up a totally new vertical in your company, then your product metrics are going to be those top line uh, company metrics like monthly active users, um, subscribers, revenue, uh, customers and so on, customer account. Um, they can also be narrow. So it can be focused on your uh, top line metrics for your website, uh, or they could be technical. So uh, if you're uh, sort of on the um, capability side uh, of your company, they can uh, be in like site performance or whatever, but no matter what your product is or what your uh, fo focus is in this list of top line metrics, they need to ladder up on to, uh, onto financials, or they typically do. Um, and sometimes that connection may not be obvious, especially if you're on the sort of engineering or capability side, but it is important to find out um, what those metrics are for your business so that when you're prioritizing features as a product manager, you're prioritizing uh, and comparing based on apples to apples. So uh, you wanna make sure that all the features you're you're building uh, or thinking about, they sort of ladder up to those, that same, uh, that same common denominator. Uh, in this case for Spotify, it's uh, revenue. So um, the second thing is um, when you list out these metrics, you wanna make sure to list out what are your data sources for these things. Uh, you need to be transparent so that uh, your leaders can independently verify what they're seeing in the model. Um, I had to make some assumptions here because I'm, I don't work for Spotify, so I don't have access to all of their internal data. Um, but typically for these top line metrics, you should not need to uh, make assumptions. Um, and uh, on the third column here, you wanna list out your, um, your baseline. So what is what is your uh, today look like? Uh, I look for, I typically myself look for um, the most recent time period, like the most recent quarter, um, but the most recent quarter or so uh, is, is the best. Okay. So that was that. Step two. So once you have your static metrics, so you, you've gotten, you've talked to finance, you've looked in, um, analytics and you've pulled out this data, 
uh, and you have the static data, you then need to you then need to convert that static data into formulas, um, so that when you change any of your key, key performance indicators, you can see how those changes affect your financials. Um, so uh, this is necessary to be able to do forecasting. Um, so, for example, um, in the case of ad supported revenue, uh, let me see here. In case of ad supported revenue, uh, your average monthly listening time for Sp Spotify um, equals the average, sorry, ad supported revenue equals average monthly listening time times average ad supported revenue per minute. Uh, so that's a little bit hard to understand. I think the easiest way to think about how to convert static to static data to formulas is um, using this example. So imagine your static metrics are, uh, you have, uh, you operate a fruit market and your revenue is $1,000 uh, per month, let's say. And your total fruit sold is a thousand pieces of fruit. So your total revenue per fruit is a dollar. That's your static metric. The formula for that would be fruit market revenue equals total number of fruit sold times the dollar revenue per fruit. Uh, so that's sort of how you do that conversion. And you need to do that for every uh, piece of static data in your spreadsheet, or as many as you can. Okay. Once you've listed out your top line metrics and you, you've converted those to formulas, um, you need to then list out how your product or feature will affect those top line metrics based on your assumptions, market research, A-B testing, et cetera. So, Describe how your features affect those top line metrics. Um, in this particular scenario, I made market research based assumptions about uh, podcast consumption behavior worldwide and how that behavior is reflected in Spotify's uh, products. Um, a key thing here, assumptions are necessary for estimation purposes, but you need to work to eliminate them as you make progress on discovery and building your product. Um, Assumptions represent risk and uncertainty um, in your product success. So they're necessary at the beginning when you're sort of like in discovery mode and you're trying to see whether this thing is worth building. But as you uh, make progress to build your uh, product or define it, uh, you need to sort of narrow that um, uncertainty. So you need to work on eliminating your assumptions, but you can start with the sum and I have them here. Um, step four, so I've gotten my top line metrics, I've converted them to formulas, I've added in the details about my product or feature. Um, then I want to show um, what are what is my range of estimates um, for how my product will perform? Uh, what is my conservative estimate? What is my neutral one? And what is my higher optimistic estimate? Um, so you want to provide that range because we don't exactly know how this product will perform, but we can make some assumptions. Um, and typically you want to, once you've sort of like put this all together, you want to make your decisions based on that low to neutral, um, low to neutral range. Uh, so your low range of this model needs to be compelling um, uh, to build it. So once you have all this data, um, you have your assumptions, um, you want to apply those assumptions um, to your low, medium, and high columns. So for example, for Spotify, um, I have uh, made some assumptions about how Spotify will contribute to, um, sorry, the podcast will contribute to Spotify's organic uh, MAU growth rate. I've also made some assumptions about um, the growth in the podcast engagement rate for Spotify. Uh, same thing, average listening time, I've made some assumptions there. Um, and uh, assumptions around podcast completion rate. And I've also made some assumptions around, uh, or estimates around royalty, royalty payments. Uh, once you've built this model, make sure to check your formulas in your math. So a good way to do this is by changing your variables and see how that affects the model. Uh, you'll notice issues really quickly. 
Um, so as an example here, I'm changing uh, my podcast engagement rate to see how that affects the model. And early on, I did notice issues with this. Um, so I, uh, I made sure to correct those. So make sure to check that math uh, really well because you're, you're about to make decisions based on this model. Uh, when you share this model out, uh, make sure to give your business leaders the ability to change the variables so that they can test drive your model. Don't just hand them a static spreadsheet with all the data just um, uh, printed out. Uh, make sure that they can actually manipulate the model. Um, provide the, the summary page uh, for those who kind of, kind of just makes it easier to present and make sure to describe your key assumptions here. Um, so uh, for Spotify, a couple examples are um, uh, Spotify doesn't pay royalty payments for podcast streams. So the increasing ratio of podcast streaming compared to music streaming will decrease Spotify's quarterly royalty payments and improve their gross margin. Um, I've also described how I have assumptions around the um, podcast business contribution to their MAU growth. Um, and also assumptions around uh, podcast consumption and music consumption on Spotify to contribute to these numbers. So that's it. Um, I know that was a lot and it seems a little bit opaque. Um, so I've provided uh, at the end of this deck, um, a link to this spreadsheet where you can play with the model. I've also have uh, templates and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a second. Okay, conclusion. Uh, so what did we talk about today? Um, an estimated business value model is a method to estimate the business value that a product will generate when it acts on its leverage point. We estimate business value so that we can work on high impact features, spend resources wisely, do the right thing, build the right stuff, don't build the wrong stuff, and allow the best ideas to win. An estimated business value model is a starting point. It helps you understand the potential impact of your product or feature compared to other things you're planning. It helps you identify your key assumptions. Um, and assumptions help inform your learning agenda, i.e. an assumption is a hypothesis that you need to validate with your own internal A-B testing, uh, qualitative and quantitative research. So it's a starting point. Uh, these models help you justify, uh, quantify your work to business leaders, teammates, and stakeholders. It's not 100% accurate and it isn't meant to be, but you need to strive for higher accuracy over time, um, where by the time you launch your product or post-launch, your model needs to basically uh, be really tight so that you can evaluate product performance. Um, so it's, it's a great, uh, great approach. And these models get easier with practice. They, you know, when you first start out, you don't know where your data is. Uh, you don't know how to build these uh, formulas. Uh, it's very confusing. It takes weeks. Um, just practice. Start small. Start with easy features um, and kind of work up. It, they, they do get easier with practice. Um, and in terms of resources, so. Um, I've included a link to this Google spreadsheet that I uh, demoed today in the deck. Um, that spreadsheet includes uh, the uh, model that I shared today for Spotify podcasts. It has a model template anyone can use and also model template examples for other use cases. So uh, please feel free to use everything. Um, and by the way, in the deck, I did include my email uh, and I think my LinkedIn's in there too. So. Um, I'm happy to uh, to help a, uh, anybody on these. Uh, I may not be able to re reply to everyone, uh, but if you reach out to me, um, I'll be happy to look at your models and give you feedback because um, I think coaching is helpful. And so I'll do the best I can. Um, and that, that was basically it. I hope this was really helpful. I know it was a lot to digest and I do talk fast. Apologies for that. Um, and... I want to reiterate, I'm not a finance major or an MBA candidate or anyone like that, um, but 
Uh, this approach uh, has worked for me really well in the companies I work, work for. Um, they're great at aligning stakeholders. Um, they're great at prioritizing features when the prioritization isn't obvious. Um, they're great for talk, kind of providing your teammates um, with sort of a, an idea into what is the impact of the things you're planning. So um, it's a really good approach and uh, I hope you have the chance to try it out. Um, and uh, good luck. And th thanks again to Product School for everything. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's feedback here. Um, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.